Thank you so much, Leah, for your, your welcome, and thank you for inviting us. Um, it's great to hear your heart uh, for the, the work here at IEC, and we, we share that, that vision too. We long to see parents discipling their children, and we're, we're so impressed with, with the way Leah has been managing the ministries in that way. But um, you probably don't know who we are. We're not famous. We've just got children, that's all. Um, but my name is Adam. Uh, I work for the government in the United Kingdom, and I, I work in environmental health, if any of you know what that is. And we've been married for 26 years. To, I remember that. I had to look it up, but I, I did uh, write it down. And we, we have four children. And our eldest is now 20. Uh, our next one down is 18. They're the two boys. And then we have two girls. Uh, their, their ages are 16 and 13. And you may ask why we, we're doing this type of thing. Well, I think it was about seven years ago, our eldest boy was causing us all sorts of difficulties. And he was 13 at the time. And so we needed some help ourselves. And we thought we need to go and do some research and some reading. And when we were doing this, we found that other parents were interested and, and concerned and needing the same type of help um, that we were seeking. And, and so we got, to, we got some groups going and, and the ministry began from there and... and Praise God, uh, our child became much better. Um, and that was basically through prayer. Um, very little to do with us. I'm sure it was God doing his work. And in fact, he worked in the church uh, two years ago. And we, we were very blessed by that, the change in his life. But we have been through some very difficult times, and we've been some, through some very good times. Through the difficult times, we've made mistakes. We've made lots of mistakes. But hopefully we can learn from our mistakes and move on. And hopefully some of the mistakes that we've made, we can help others not to make the same mistakes. So thank you so much for coming here. I, I'd like Rosie to introduce herself and then we'll get started. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to share just a little bit about what I, my job currently is because it's, it is relevant to what we're talking about partly. Um, up until about three years ago, I worked three days a week um, for our church, um, mainly in discipleship um, and some of the small groups as well and parenting stuff. Um, but then I had a very clear call from God that he wanted me to change my job. It was a complete shock and surprise for me. Um, and I now work also for local government, but I work with families. And I work with families that are particularly having difficulties um, some of their children might be getting into trouble with the police or not going to school. Um, they might be causing trouble on the streets, what we call antisocial behavior. Um, families where neither of the parents are working, so money is very, very tight. And I work with the families to look at what's happened um, in that family to try and understand why things are difficult for them at the moment and help them um, make some changes to hopefully make things get better for them so that's that's what I currently do it's quite challenging work but I, I absolutely love it I love going out and meeting the families and working quite closely with them so I'm going to hand back to Adam now and we're going to kick off with what we're going to talk to you about thank you well it, it's wonderful to hear Leah talk about the the Christian uh, the IEC Christian Education Ministry and it's wonderful that churches have got ministries that support children and they have these thriving programs, they have discipleship groups, they present the gospel. 
But just as Leah said, the responsibility for, par- for discipling our children rests with, with us, with me, with Rosie, with you. The responsibility lies right here. When, when Moses received the, the Ten Commandments and the law, in Deuteronomy 4, verse 9, he said, teach them to your children. He's talking to the parents. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. And we're going to be looking at discipling children in our homes, and we're going to be looking at how important it is to guard our own walk with the Lord, the importance of prayer, and how love and discipline, how they go hand in hand, and how important that is in raising our children. So that's the program. Now, we will obviously be talking, but there will be breaks, and this, in my view, is probably the most important part of the evening. We'll be asking you some questions, and if you're here with your partner, it'd be great to discuss those questions together. And if you're not here with, with your partner, just you can either reflect yourself or you can join up with somebody close to you when we consider these questions. But it'd be great if you can engage with that time because you'll get the most out of it. So, a wonderful verse in, in Micah 6 verse 8 where it says, What does the Lord require of you? And he's talking to, to man to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So for us, what does it mean to walk humbly with our God? Because if we want our children to walk humbly with our God, we need to do that as a model. We need to show them the way ourselves. So what does it mean to walk humbly with our God? Well, think about your relationship with your child. Now, if you were to merely give them food, give them a place to live, take them to the doctor when they're unwell, to dress them and get them off to school, if that was all you were doing, there'd be something big missing. Something big. Because our relationship with our child is much more than the physical, as we know. There's emotional care that we need to give them. We want to spend quality time with them. We want to be with them. We want to enjoy their company. And as we do that, we can then teach them and they can learn from us. Because they're looking to us. They look up to us. They, when, whether we like it or not, they'll be learning from us. And we want, as parents, to have a closeness, a closeness to our children. And it's the same with our loving Heavenly Father. Pastor Jerry spoke on Sunday here at IEC about our Father. He is our loving Father. And he wants that closeness with us just as we as parents want a closeness with our children. He's drawn us close in Jesus. He's come down, he's met us at our need, and his divine purpose is that we can know him for ourselves. And we read in Ephesians that he chose that we are to be adopted as his sons, so we can have that relationship with him. That That's what he wants, and that's what... Uh, We long for our children. So the wonderful thing is that as we seek, as we as parents seek closeness with our loving Heavenly Father, so it benefits our family. And there's a verse in Proverbs that says, He who fears the Lord had a secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge. So as we lay a foundation and as we have the security in our relationship with our Heavenly Father, so our children will also have that refuge. It's a wonderful promise. 
So how can we walk humbly with our God? We need to spend time with God. We need to spend time daily with our God. And the, the sense of walking humbly has got an unhurried feel about it. It's not rushed. It's, it's easy. It's, it's slow. It's deliberate. It's an unhurried pace. And with children, that can be very, very difficult to find time to spend with God. It can be very difficult. So if you've got younger children, you may need to, to take advantage of those times when, when perhaps your children are sleeping uh, to spend time with God. It can be difficult with your busy lives. Um, Leah has spoken about the, the ministries that she oversees and, and the, the, the good work that many of you do. And it's a full packed program. And I'm, I guess with children and with, with doing everything and meeting their needs, it means you're very busy. But it's important that we spend time with our God. And you as parents, as couples, as partners, you can encourage one another. You can respect each other's time so that you're enabling your partner, your, your spouse, to have time with the Lord. And another great thing, which Rosie will talk about later, is as parents pray together. There's, there's a, a friend of ours at, at our church in Brighton that always says, those that pray together stay together. And in, in the UK, divorce is a, is a big issue for us in the UK. I hope it's not here, but it's a big issue for us in the UK. But those that pray together stay together. So we need to walk humbly with our God. We need to guard our own walk with the Lord. We also need to model our faith to our children. And in, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we, we read this. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, in the, in the UK translation... In the English translation, I, I should say, the word reflect is not big enough to cope with the Greek word that, that we read there. It's reflect and contemplate. And the, the idea there is that as we dwell on the Lord and on his glory, we begin to reflect that glory as we contemplate, we reflect. The, the, it's all wrapped up in the same word. As we dwell on him and his glory, we begin to reflect that. And we will be reflecting the fruit of the Spirit. Those, that wonderful list of the characteristics of God himself, of Jesus. We begin to exhibit those characteristics. <clears throat> So it's important that, that we also acknowledge that we as parents are not perfect. Now, I, I don't know if any of you think you're perfect, um, but I've got some bad news uh, for you if you think that, because the gospel says that we, need, we need the gospel because we're not perfect. And it's not a bad thing to acknowledge to your children that, that we're not perfect because that is demonstrating our need for a saviour. So it's not a bad thing to acknowledge that to your children and that begins to model the faith that we have. It's also important that we're, we're thankful. We live lives of thankfulness. The, the fact that we have this ongoing relationship with our Heavenly Father and the fact that we're not walking a tightrope of his love, but we're on this wide, this wide and high and long and deep, broad road of his love 
it's, you can't fall off the pathway of his love. It's not a tightrope. We need to be thankful for that, for the wonderful love that God has expressed in Jesus. It's also important that we, at the early stages of when we start to have difficulties, that we act upon those. Now, the sort of thing I'm thinking of, that there are, to, to remember these easily, there are five Ds. There's when we experience disappointments or discouragements or doubt or we start to be depressed or despairing. The five Ds, disappointment, discouragement, doubt, depression, despair. We need to catch ourselves early. And just as King David did, we need to find our strength in the Lord. We also need to be at peace with others because we know that, as, as Romans says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And we shouldn't badmouth anyone, particularly in front of our children. I mean, don't do it anyway, but particularly in front of our children because what is that showing? So we need to model this type of faith. We also need to teach uh, repentance and forgiveness in our home. Now, um, I was taking my son out when he was a little boy uh, on his bike. He was just learning to ride his bike, and we were going along on the pavement, you know, the sidewalk, and he lost control, and he smashed into a, a standing car, a parked car. Now, I had to bite my tongue a little um, because we should express forgiveness. I should express forgiveness. He'd done something pretty uh, annoying to me because I knew this was going to be a problem. The person whose car it was had no idea this had happened. And so he was in his house. And uh, I didn't know this person. It was around the corner from us. So what did I do? I could have... I could have just said, okay, Sam, let, let, let's go, let's carry on, and ignored the whole thing. And to be honest, that was a temptation. Nobody saw it happen. There was this damaged car. There was my son who was a little bit upset about it. But we need to teach forgiveness and repentance. And so what, what I had to do was, as I say, bite my tongue a little. I had to hold my anger because I was pretty annoyed about the whole thing. And then I, I knocked on a few doors to find out whose car it was. And then I had to put my hand in my pocket over once they found out how much it would cost and, and get the, the damage sorted out. But if I'd walked away at that point, what would that have been teaching <coughs> my son? What would that have taught him? That wouldn't have been good. That would have been teaching him that if you can get away with it, try getting away with it. But we need to teach and model uh, repentance and forgiveness. We need to encourage our children, particularly with their siblings, to say, I forgive you when they've done, when something's happened to them. Or we need to get them to, um, or we need to offer forgiveness to them if they've done something wrong to ourselves or to, to their siblings. So, Another important thing, I think, in modeling our faith is, is telling our story of how we became Christians, how Jesus has impacted our lives. We need to be open with these things with our children. We need to share our story of faith. And we need to let them see our faith in action. And as a family, it's a good idea to pray together, which Rosie will be talking about later. And to use our gifts within the body of the church. And it was wonderful to spend that time with the Sunday school uh, teachers on Sunday. And I think some of you may be here. Uh, and it was a wonderful opportunity where your, your children were there as well and were, were seeing 
how important ministry is and using your gifts in the body of the churches. So uh, we really appreciated that time and we thank you for that. It's also really important, of course, to read the Bible together as a family. So I think a lot of these things you will be very well aware of. But what I'd like you to do now is just to think. There's a couple of questions which hopefully are on your sheets. There's the first question, which is, what changes can I make to walk more closely with my Heavenly Father? What changes can I make to walk more closely with my Heavenly Father, knowing that this will help our children? And how can I model my faith to my children? So I'd like to give you a few minutes, if that's okay, to consider those questions. As I say, it would be great if you could discuss those with, with your, your partner. Um, and if, if you haven't got your partner here, that's fine. You can either talk to somebody else or you can just reflect by yourself. But you may find it useful to work through some of these things with, with somebody else. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to have a think about that and then Rosie's going to take the next slot.
how's it going with that? It's lovely to see you all chatting and, and thinking about those questions. I'm just going to move on if that's okay. You're fine to carry on getting your, your drinks and, and refreshments, that's fine. But I'm just going to move on to the next part um, if that's okay. So Adam's talked about modeling our faith and how important it is that we keep our own walk with the Lord alive and, and well and that we model that to our children. But I want to talk to you for a minute about praying for our children. And I, I've called it Pray Without Ceasing because... I think, personally, that this is one of the, the most important things as parents that we can do for our children. As I'm talking, by the way, I'm going to refer to quite a few Bible verses, so if you want to jot them down um, to look at later, that, that you may find that helpful. Um, but and what does it mean to actually pray without ceasing? Because we all know we don't walk around all the time praying. Well, I don't, anyway. So what does that actually mean? So we're going to think a little bit about that as well. Now, there's nothing that's going to influence our children's faith, their character, or any aspect of their life more than prayer. And as parents, we have a responsibility and a privilege to pray for our children. There's a verse in Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 19, which says, Arise, cry out in the night, as the watches of the night begin. Pour out your heart like water, in the presence of the Lord, lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children. Now, as the watches of the night begin, to me, that suggests when you go to bed. Um, now, I don't know about you, but when I get into bed, all I want to do is go to sleep, to be honest. But I think it's really important just to remember our children as we get into bed. And it talks about pouring out our hearts like water, in the presence of the Lord. Now, what does water do? It gushes, it flows, it spreads out, doesn't it? Wherever it goes, it spreads. And to me, that is like praying without ceasing, praying all the time, whatever you're doing. So prayer is just a part of what you're doing. You may not necessarily be praying out loud or, or stopping and praying, but whatever you're doing, just holding your children in your mind before the Lord. Now, why is it so important for us to pray for our children? Well, we know we have an enemy, the devil. And in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, it says, The devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may destroy. Now, we don't have um, dangerous animals, really, in the UK. But I know you do have lions and, and cheetahs and other big cats that, that prey on herds. And from what I understand, from what I've seen on the TV, is that often a lion, for example, will look at a herd and it will look for the most vulnerable, the weakest, the smallest, perhaps, um, young calf or member of that herd. And that's the one they will pick out and try to catch. And it's interesting, isn't it, that, that Peter refers to the devil like a lion looking for someone to devour. And I really believe he's looking to, to, to steal our children away because they are young, they are vulnerable, they often don't have um, the capacity to really pray for themselves and stand firm in their own strength. And as parents, we need to do that for them. We need to pray for them um, and pray that, that they will be protected from the devil. And, you know, God answers prayer. I could stand here and tell you numerous examples um, of prayers that God answered for my children. I don't have time to do that, unfortunately. Um, but it works. But God answers prayer. He hears us and he answers us. And it can really free us up from worrying about our children if we're giving our worries to God and asking him to change those things, to protect them. It puts us in a, in a dependent position. We're looking to God to change them, to help them to protect them, to save them. Um, and we're not looking in our, for our own strength for things that we can do, but we're, we're ex asking God to do it. And actually when we pray, it's part of us expressing our faith as well. I mean, yes, pray for your children when they're not there, but pray with them as well so they can see that you're, you're trusting in God to do those things for them that they can't do for themselves. 
It's not dependent on how we're feeling or on us being original in what we're saying or having lots of long words or important sounding words. You know, it's just between our heart and God's heart. And be persistent as well when you pray for your children. There are some things um, that we've been praying for our children since they were very little. And some of those things have been answered, but not all of them have yet. And we're still praying for those things. And as Adam said, our eldest is now 20. And there are still things that we're praying for him that we started praying when he was very little. In fact, even before he was born. So we need to be persistent. So what sort of things could we pray for our children? I know it's, it's really easy, isn't it, to get caught up in the day-to-day busyness of life and the day-to-day worries as well and just think about what's presented in front of you and for praying for that thing. But I really believe God wants us to think big and to pray big prayers for our children. Um, I mean, the most important prayer we can ever pray for them has to be that they would have an awareness of God's love and a responsive heart, that they will come to know him for themselves. We can't pray anything more important than that. And, you know, we we need to be praying that every day for our children. And even after they have um, expressed faith themselves and invited Jesus into their hearts, I think we need to keep praying for them because we all know what it's like. It's, It's not easy being a Christian and being a believer. And there's lots of temptations. And I think particularly when they're young, there's lots of temptations. So keep praying for them. There's a verse in in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, which it talks about Jesus. It's just after he's um, been in in the temple when he was 12 years old and his parents have just found him and, and he's gone home with them. And it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And I've, I've used this verse quite often when I've been praying for my children um, because it looks, it, it covers everything really. Um, it, you know, it says Jesus grew in wisdom, so he grew intellectually. He learnt things when he was at school and he, he learnt things and he grew, his, in, his intellect grew. And we, it's important that we pray for that for our children. Um, he grew in stature, so he grew physically. And again, it's important that we pray for the physical growth and well-being of our children. He grew in favor with God, so he grew spiritually. And again, as I said, even when they've come to faith, keep praying that they will keep growing in their faith and that God would would stretch their faith even. And and they would would have that experience of, of God showing up when they need him. And he also grew in favor with man, so he grew socially. He had friends. He was liked by people. Um, And that's really important that we pray that for our children as well, that that others are drawn to them. I I prayed this actually particularly for our eldest son. I felt it was something that God laid on my heart to pray for him, Um, that others would be attracted to him. Um, And I didn't really understand why that was something I needed to pray for him, but I I felt that it was. And as he's grown up, he has been... He's been, oh, he was a very popular child at school. He's always had lots of friends. Um, and now, as, as he's gone through his teenage years, and now he's 20, he's a really likable person. I know I'm a bit biased because I'm his mother, <laughs> but he is. He's just, other people have said that there's something about him that is very attractive. And I think, um, as a, he is a Christian, and I think that as he, God will be able to use that, uh, that quality in him to draw others to himself. That, that others will listen to him because they like him and they'll, they'll be interested in what he's got to say about his own faith. So th- those are four things we can pray just from, from Luke chapter 52. Um, but we can also pray um, that they would have a hatred of sin. You know, Psalm 45 verse 7 talks about God loving righteousness and hating wickedness. And we can pray f- that our children would love to do the right thing. Um, and that they would really hate sin, that they would develop this dislike of sin and they would see it as, as, a, as a wrong thing. Another thing I prayed for, for my son, actually, was that he would understand the seriousness of sin um, and that if he did do wrong things, which, let's face it, all children do, that he would get caught, found out and caught and that he would have to face the consequences 
And I remember telling him, I didn't tell him at the time, but I remember telling him this a number of years later that this was something I'd been praying for him. And he was completely outraged. <laughs> he thought it was terrible that I was praying that he'd get found out. He said, you're my mum. I said, yes, exactly. I want you to realise that, you know, when you sin, there are consequences. And, and that was something that I, I did pray for him. Um, on a slightly more positive note, we can also pray that God would give them responsible attitudes. So if we think of the example of Daniel, it says in Daniel chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, that he so distinguished himself with his exceptional qualities. He was noticed um, by those in authority. He had exceptional qualities. Now, we're not quite told the detail of that, but I imagine that it would be things like honesty and integrity, um, kindness, all those fruits of the Spirit. And he had them to such a degree that it was really noticeable. And we can pray for our children that they would have those qualities as well, that they would stand out. We can pray that they would have respect for elders. They would show proper respect for everybody. We can pray for their friendships, that they would have good friends and not friends that would draw them away from God, but friends that would encourage them. I prayed for another one of our sons, actually, that um, when he, quite a few years ago, he had a friend at school who we felt was actually quite a bad influence on him. He wasn't a good friend. And I was quite concerned that if they stayed close friends, that um, it would not be a good thing for our son. So I prayed that, um, that the friendship would break up, that, that God would remove this, this boy from his life. And uh, he actually moved him to another town, <laughs> which was fantastic for, for me. <laughs> Be careful what you pray for. Um, but we can also pray for their future life partner, for their husband or wife. You know, I don't think you can ever start praying too soon for this. And, you know, we, we started praying for their future partners when they were very little because I thought, actually, the person that they're going to marry is probably been born somewhere, they're being raised by parents, hopefully, somewhere. And, you know, we've prayed that the person they're going to marry, their future life partner, will be raised by godly parents in a godly way, that they would be taught to have faith as well, and that they would be um, someone that will really support them in their faith when they eventually meet that person. I think as well, Adam was talking earlier about us modelling our faith, and I think we can pray for ourselves that we would be able to be a good example to our children because it's not easy, let's be honest. It's not easy being a parent, um, and it is easy to fall into sin, to get angry with them, to sin in our parenting. So I think we can pray for ourselves as well um, that we would be a good example to them. And when they have specific things happening in their lives, so when they're starting school, you know, you can pray that God would place good friends around them. When they're, if you're moving area, it's the same thing. Um, if you know there's something going on for them when they're facing exams in school or, or other things, just pray for those things. Don't leave it um, for chance, just for what happens, what happens, but bring it before God. And don't wait for the perfect time to pray either. You know, you can pray any time. I learned quite quickly when my children were little. Well, before I had children, I never had a problem finding time to pray. I used to pray every morning um, when I got up. But once our first child was born, he was always awake before me, woke me up. So that time was gone. And I very quickly learned that, you know, if I'm going to maintain my relationship with God, I've got to find another way doing this and I would pray when I was out walking with him I would pray when I was washing the dishes I would pray sometimes when we were playing together just pray silently um, you've just got to find any time any place really and it doesn't have to be a long time that you've got to put aside you know it can be a few seconds can make a big difference if you're talking to God One of the things I did used to do uh, every single day when they were all going to school, we used to leave by the back door of our house and on the inside of the back door, I had a prayer chart 
So each day of the month, there was a different thing to pray for. And it would be different aspects of their character that I wanted God to um, develop in them. So it would be things like, some of the things we've talked about, like respect. Or another day, I might pray that he would develop patience in them or that he would give them a merciful heart. Um, I can't remember all of them. There were 31 of them, <laughs> for each one for each day of the month. And every morning, I would stop, because the hour before I left the house was chaos. It was chaos. I had four young children. I learned very quickly that the best way to get them out of the house was to get the youngest one ready first, the baby, that couldn't move. So I'd get her all wrapped up, because it was cold. It's not like it is here. We had to put coats and shoes and scarves and hats and all sorts on. So I'd do the baby first on the floor. She can't move. She can't take anything off. Because if I did the oldest one first, by the time I'd done the baby, the oldest one had taken everything off again. So <laughs> it's true. So I did the baby first and then worked up to the oldest one. And then we were ready to go. But it was always really frantic. So it was really important for me... I think, to stop. When everyone was ready, we just stopped for about 10 seconds, probably. 10, 15 seconds. I would say the prayer. It was one sentence over them, just as we left the house, and then we'd walk to school. And I did that for years, really, until I stopped walking them to school. And if I ever forgot, which I did occasionally, one of them would remind me and say, Mummy, we haven't prayed. And it made such a difference to our day. It made a big difference to our walk to school, but I believe for the whole day. And I think God is still answering some of those prayers that I prayed for him to develop those characteristics in them. He hasn't forgotten. Okay, so I think you've got the message. You need to pray for your children and to think big, to not just look at the day-to-day -day things, but to think, to pray big prayers for your children. So, can you take a few minutes? There are some questions on your sheet. Um, think, what are you currently praying for your children? What else could you or do you want to be praying for them? And how are you going to make time for this? Do you need to put aside a special time? Or is it something that you can do as part of your everyday activities? So take a few minutes just to, to think about those questions and then we'll, we'll come back together again in a few minutes. Okay.
right, I'm sorry to stop the conversations. Um, it's good to hear them. That's really, really good. But I think because of time, we need to move on. So we're, we're going to look at the next section about love and discipline. And these two are very much linked. And I'm just going to briefly touch on love. And Rosie, because she likes the discipline bit, she's going to do discipline. But the way a child is parented has a big impact on how they will relate to God. Because as God shows us love and discipline, so we have the responsibility to show love and discipline to our children. Now, children long to be, uh, or long to know they're, they're loved, they're unconditionally loved. We all need that, we all need that. But children need it because it, it, it enables them to, to grow and to mature. They need to know that they're accepted and valued. Now, the, each of our children has this uh, uh, hole, if you like, a capacity. Think of it like an, an emotional tank that needs to be topped up for our children to thrive. So if you think of a car, the car has a, a fuel tank. And if the fuel tank gets too low, the car will stop working. It doesn't function. And our children have got an emotional tank which needs to be kept topped up, otherwise they will cease to function properly. And our children's behavior can often be a measure of how topped up this emotional tank is. So when they start being irritable and unreasonable, and maybe they, they're winding their brothers or sisters up, this could be an indication that their emotional tank is low. So what can we do to keep it topped up? Well, the fuel for that emotional tank is unconditional love. And we need to demonstrate unconditional love to our children. They need to know that they're loved. There's a great book by Gary Chapman which talks about love languages. And I know we've spoken before about this, so I'll, I'll skip over it. But it's really, really important because our children will receive and give love in different ways. And of course, we need to give love in a range, demonstrate love to our children in a range of formats. But if we can highlight or if we can use their primary love language, that is a really good way to keep that emotional tank topped up. So what are the five love languages as Gary Chapman describes them? These different ways of giving and receiving love. Well, time is the first one. Focused, undivided attention. Spending time with them. Now, <clears throat> I like watching the football, and um, I was very pleased that, that uh, is it St. George's? They, they won their recent game, 3-0, so I understand. So that was a good result. But I, I like watching Brighton and Hove Albion. They're nothing, they're probably not as good as St. George's team because they're in one of the lower divisions. But if I was to watch TV on television, I'm very much focused on the television. And sometimes if people are, are coming in, I'm, I'm giving them no attention at all. But I did find that with my sons, taking them to the football actually was quite a good, quite a good way of spending some quality time with them because it took quite a long time to get there. There's, there's obviously the 90 minutes of average football, not particularly good, but average. And there was obviously the journey home. So it just meant that we had some unhurried time together. And I found that that for, for me was a, a good way to spend some time with my children. So time is, is a love language, spending unhurried time with our children. Gifts is another. And these are, are not earned gifts. They're not things that 
we give them because they've maybe done well in their exams or they've done something well. I mean, not to say that they're... That's a good thing to do, by the way. That's really good. But, but gifts where, where there's, they're, they're undeserved. It's a bit like God's love to us. It's undeserved. But that, if your child's primary love language is gifts, that's an incredible way by giving them... It, it doesn't have to be expensive either, but giving them a gift... Um, my daughter, uh, well, the, the eldest daughter, her love lang- her primary love language is, is gifts. <clears throat> and she loves Christmas time. You know, she loves wrapping presents up. She, she likes giving presents, but she also likes receiving them. And sh- she gets so excited at Christmas time. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And it's quite easy to see that that ticks her box. That is her sort of primary love language. And sometimes I'll give her a bar of chocolate just out of the blue and, and she'll be thrilled, you know, and you can almost see the fuel gauge going up. It's great. Um, so we, we've got time, we've got gifts, we've got touch. And this is the hugs and the kisses. And with the boys, it's wrestling on the floor. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to think I came out top in some of those, but I don't think I did. I'm sure I've, I ended up with more bruises than they did, um, with my boys anyway. The next one is service, where you do things for your children, where you do unwarranted things. Obviously, you know, there are some things that you have to do for your children. You have to put food on the table. You have to buy them clothes and that sort of thing. But, but doing things for them, unwarranted, you know, maybe getting them a cup of tea if they're doing their homework or um, whatever it be, that's another love language. And words, words are very important. Words of praise, encouragement, and love. So there are five love languages that have highlighted there. Now, if your child is, is under five, you probably won't know which the primary love languages, language is for your child. Um, they need all of them, and you just need to keep expressing all of those five languages to your, your children. But when they're over seven, you'll probably have a good idea of what fills up their emotional tank best. And we've done this before. We, we've actually asked them. We asked them, <coughs> excuse me, we asked them the question, how do you know I love you? And with, with the daughter that I was talking about, she has said to us, well, because you give me presents. You know, it, it's so obvious. And uh, it, it, it just confirms, you know, what, what, what we know. But if you're unsure about your, your primary love language of your children, you can just ask them, how do you know? How do you know I love you? It's just a simple question. And you'll, you may be surprised at what they come back with. Now, as I said, it, you know, it's important that we demonstrate all these uh, love to our children in all these different ways. And what we tend to find is that we easily give love in the love language that we ourselves have. Like, for me, it's service, and I can, I can be sort of serving Rosie and doing stuff for her, um, but because her love language isn't primarily service, she's oblivious to that. <laughs> So what I need to do is figure out what Rosie's love language is so that then I can demonstrate my love in a, in a more positive fashion. And I think it's gifts. But she, 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 uh, she's got others, I know, but um, gifts is in there. Um, so it's important that we express love in a way that it'll be best received. And this actually helps with our own relationship with our partner as well. So it's not a bad thing to find out, you know, how you operate and, and how, how you demonstrate love because it'll help your own relationships. Now, I think I'd better stop there because time is running away. There are some questions, and if we have time, we'll, we'll look at those at the end. But I think it's important that Rosie talks about discipline. Thanks. Okay, so discipline. Now, I personally think that love and discipline actually go hand in hand. 
because it, it's, it's a, it can be a sensitive issue talking to parents about discipline because I think everybody has their own understanding and belief of what, when and how disciplining children, children should be carried out. And, you know, it's different. It's even different um, within each family, each child. Certainly with our children, we found that each child needed to be disciplined in a different way because what worked for one didn't work for another. Um, and that would be, you know, be different in each family. It, it's different in different cultures. There's a different expectation of, of what discipline is. But I think the thing to hold on to is that, you know, as children of God, God disciplines us when we need it because he loves us. You know, it says it, doesn't it, in uh, Hebrews 12. It talks about God disciplining his children as a father disciplines his child. And actually, when we discipline our children, we're actually modeling a relationship of love and trust that, that we have with God as well. And part of that is correction and discipline. It's God's plan, actually, that we do that. He gives parents that authority. He places children in families, and he places parents over them in authority. There's verses, verse, well, Ephesians 6, verse 1 says that children should obey their parents. This is God's desire that it's done this way. It's his plan and will. So how do we do this? Well, it's really important for children to know where the boundaries are. You know, in society, there are boundaries, um, there are rules of the road, and there are consequences if we cross those boundaries. We may get into trouble with the police, we may just have an accident in our car, but there are, ba there are consequences. And it's the same with God, isn't it? When he lays out boundaries for how we should live our lives, he says there are certain things that are not good for us, and he doesn't want us to do those things. And if we cross that boundary, and we do the things that he said aren't good for us, there's always a consequence. You know, ultimately, the consequence of sin is death. We know that. But there can be more immediate consequences as well when we sin. Um, we may hurt people um, or we may get into trouble ourselves. So it's the same with children. There should be consequences when they cross whatever the boundary is um, that you've agreed. And it'll be different for each family. Each family will have its own priorities, if you like. Um, for us, we felt there were three really important things that we wanted our children to have as boundaries. And one of them was that they should respect us as their parents, that they should respect what we ask them to do, and they should respect what we say. And we felt that that was a really important boundary that we wanted to have in place. Another one was that they should respect each other as siblings and each other's property. So that meant they couldn't go and take things from each other without asking if they could borrow them. They couldn't break something that belonged to somebody else. They couldn't hit, hit each other because they needed to respect each other. And we felt that that was something important that we wanted to have as a, as a boundary in our family. And the third one we had was that they should always tell the truth. Now, I don't know why, but for me, telling the truth was just really important. And it was something that I wanted to lay down as a boundary and say, I want you to always tell me the truth. Even if it's not good news, it may get you into trouble, but it'll be worse if you lie about it. Um, and that was the third boundary that, that we had. And we made sure that we told them when they were old enough to understand what those boundaries were. And if they didn't keep to them, that there was a consequence. Now, again, I don't want to go into a great lot of detail about consequences. It's best if, if they cross a boundary that the consequence that follows is related to that. So if it's a young child, for example, and they've taken something that doesn't belong to them, the consequence is that they, they don't have that toy or activity or whatever it is. Um, so it, it's better that, it, it, that it, it sort of fits, it makes sense to the child that what's happening to them is related to what they've done. Does that make sense? Now, in an ideal world, <laughs> you know, having, uh, having a boundary there and telling, explaining to the child what it is would be enough and that they would never even consider crossing that boundary. But we all know that's, that's not the case. Um, one of ours in particular, one of our children, if you told him that the line was there and he couldn't cross it, he would go up to it and he would do like, 
the foot would go over the line just to see what would happen. Oh, he was hard work. <laughs> he was hard work. But that, that was his character, and that's the way God made him, and we had to deal with it. Um, but if they grow up with no consequences, you know, what do they learn from that? Actually, it's not reflecting real life, is it? And it's not reflecting how God deals with us either. So I think it's really important that they they have boundaries and they have the consequences and that, if possible, the consequences are linked to the thing that they've done wrong. Um, And try not to make it too harsh either um, because it can can create bitterness in a child if if they're punished too severely. But don't make it too soft either, because then there's no pain is there for them. There's no, what are they learning from that? Um, So I think I'm going to stop there. There are some questions um, for you to think about just in the few minutes that remain. Think about how you receive love, just thinking about what Adam was talking about. How do you receive love? What do you think is your love language? And and what do you think is your children's love language as well? And then think about what is your child learning about God from the way that you love and discipline them? What are they learning about God from the way that you love and discipline them? Are they clear? Are there boundaries in your home? Do the children know what they are? Have you talked to them about them? them? And how well do you think you're doing in this whole area of love and discipline? And, And what do you find hard? What do you need to ask God? for help with. There's quite a lot of questions there. <laughs> probably not, you're probably going to need to take them away and think about them as well when you get home, but um, I'm just going to actually end just with um, a few thoughts about parenting. Some things that I learned really along the way. Enjoy each moment. The years really do go very quickly. Enjoy each moment. Remember the special moments. Try to live without regrets. Now, that's not to say don't be sorry for things when they go wrong, but accept that we do get things wrong and and move on from it. Don't keep punishing yourself for the things that you got wrong. See the positive things that are happening with your children. Laugh a lot. Okay. I tend to be, tend to err on the more serious side probably, and I think I could have laughed more. Laugh a lot. And finally, a quote from um, Rob Parsons, who's quite well known in the UK. He writes about parenting and he says, don't take all the credit and don't take all the blame. And I'm going to leave you with that thought and to think about those questions. And thank you so much for coming. Should we, should we pray together? <clears throat> Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of parenting. Thank you for the precious gift of of children and Lord we know it comes with great responsibility and Father we need your help please help us as we try to do the right thing for our children Lord we want to we want our children to know you primarily we want them to come to an understanding of your grace and you as saviour of the world and now I ask each one here Lord that you would equip them to be the best parents they can be. Please help them, I pray. Please help us. And uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, that we can share this time together in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.